You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. And welcome to this week's edition of The Game Corner, uh, episode 12, I believe. My name is Keanu Calicorn, as always. And we have a brand new friend with us this week, and his name is Paul Fitzpatrick. He is currently studying philosophy in Dublin, but he is originally from New Jersey. How are you doing today, Paul? I'm doing pretty good today. It's a uh, it's bit of a sunny day. That's nice. Went for a bit of, for a, bit of a walk. Got to take care of that when you can here. Um, yeah, everything's all right over here. Excellent. Now, before we kind of get into all the games and stuff, uh, most of most of the time in the previous episodes, people either know me or reach out to me through the internet. We kind of met because kind of got chatting in the shop I work in. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? Mm-hmm. So it's uh, uh, something to do with wearing a heartless T-shirt. And that heart. was it. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, because it's it's such a Kingdom Hearts is such a funny series. It's a big thing, but mm-hmm. I I've barely known anyone who's ever played it. Have you found that with Kingdom Hearts like Yeah, you know, and so a couple of immediate friends, yeah, have played it and, and we sort of have that connection. But you know what's really funny is I wear that shirt around a lot or I have another I have a couple other Kingdom Hearts shirts. And whenever I go around and sort of like when I've been doing tours and like uh, people will, if I'm wearing that shirt people will be like, "Hey, nice." And it's like Oh, okay, there's a nerd. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, that, that's good. That's good. They don't think I'm a Satanist or something with a heart. Uh, yeah, so, I yeah. don't know. It's like, it's the, um, I love the Kingdom Hearts. I've only played the first one and uh, Birth by Sleep. But like, when mm. I see that heart, the symbol, I immediately get PTSD from the fight with Riku. Oh, God. Which, yeah. where you originally you couldn't skip the scene. Is there, was there any bit in Kingdom Hearts you really got stuck on? Uh, Definitely the last fight with Ansem, because I, I also played the first, I mean, I've, I've, I've pretty much played them all except for a few of the, I never finished Dream Drop Distance, I, I started it, and that was, you know, towards the end of that series is when it starts to get really wonky, and I was just like, I know where the plot goes, I, I don't know. <laughs> but, well, uh, but, yeah. yeah, it's because that's a problem in and of itself, I, uh, because uh, my fiance Stevie is huge into Disney, and mm. I tried to take her through the Kingdom Hearts games, but for the life of me, it's not like, it's more confusing than Star Wars, it's not as simple as 1, 2, 3, there are games oh, yeah. in between 1 and 2, there are games before 1, and they don't make it the easiest thing to just follow it, unless you were going with it as they were being released, right? The first game is just about a, a group of friends who get lost and trying to find your friends again and, and make new friends along the way. And it's handled fun and, and light, and but also like really dark, dark moments. And really, it's and the second one is also, I think, very good. But the minute they start to add time travel and clone, <laughs> and it's it just gets very esoteric very quickly. And I did finish the third game and. You know, it was, I wasn't exactly happy with it. I, I don't know. You just sort of shrug by the end of it. I mean, there's some fun, fun moments. There's some fun gameplay, but then there's some, some hallway levels that just feel like chores. I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's that, you know. I know what you mean, though. It's like uh, Kingdom Hearts, I think, gets by on even if the story is impossible to follow, which it really shouldn't be for a series that includes Donald Duck, but however, <laughs> um, <laughs> then it still gets by on incredible gameplay, which is like, even when you're stuck, it's so easy to pick up and just have fun and swing a sword and you really get that feedback. Oh, yeah. Like, and, and, and some it, of the characters, too, you really stick with. I mean, like the stuff with Sora, Donald, and Goofy, like, and that was what... Not not all. Some of the other offshoot games were, I think, very good. I liked uh, Dream Drop. This no, I liked Birth by Sleep quite a bit. I liked, um, oh gosh, I'm trying. There's so many of <laughs> trying to think, but like really, the stuff with that main that main trio is just really fun. And and when you do get to Kingdom Hearts three, it's like, oh god, I miss I miss this group of folks. But then they, you know, they're just saying like, I would have family sit and watch me while I was playing, and and there's nothing more. I want to say the word embarrassing, but like 
you sort of feel your cheeks get red while you try to explain the plot to your mother. Yeah, <laughs> it's kind of like, fuck. it's the funniest thing because like, uh, I'm also watching Buffy for the first time. And the, oh, first, yeah. and the first few episodes that I saw were like very late, season five, series six. And there's so much going on and so many characters that you just mm. feel like you can't engage with it. Then you go back to the start and you're like, this is fairly straightforward. How did we get from A to B? A to so if you haven't B. gone on the Kingdom Hearts journey, I can totally understand why people look at it and go, why is the Mickey Mouse story so confusing, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But uh, we weren't actually planning on talking about Kingdom Hearts, but that's what happens. We uh, could do a so... whole separate series on that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So before we get into more gaming stuff, although I must say I feel very vindicated having talked about that now, uh, we are kind of on the way out of the lockdown now, but how were things for you during that whole stretch? Were you based in Dublin or were you over in the US? Uh, yes, yeah, so I, um, I, I'm still here in Dublin and uh, I, I was, uh, have been studying here since September from my MA and... Um, well, yeah, I was supposed to have family come in and visit me in March for my birthday. That was one of the first few things to sort of fall through. And, you know, I was supposed to be back home in April for a wedding. And that, that, of course, fell through. And, and right about just towards the end of March was when, not the end of March, but we, we had been on break for half of March at UCD. And coming out of that was sort of when the reality hit. Because when you're not, you're not in a normal schedule anyway, it's just a break. Um, now I was very lucky to be sort of in quarantine with two very wonderful housemates, uh, who all like to bake and, uh, Oh, well that would help, yeah. wouldn't it? Oh yeah. So we, we, <laughs> we, we all like to cook, we all like to bake. So we were well fed and, uh, you know, that's good. And uh, another one of them who is, uh, likes to play games too. So we, we kept ourselves busy with that, but you know, I had to be sort of careful actually with games because I still had to do sort of term papers and you know there's some some games I had to watch out for like like I had just gotten Civ 6 in the spring and I could have dumped so much time into that just doing it like sandbox mode and just setting up a little civilization so I had to watch out for that and I had to sort of make sure I was getting outside so you know sometimes we'll try and go for a walk but uh, so I didn't want to spend too much time on the screen uh, but, but, you know, gaming was pretty important because I find, uh, I had to take a break from work, I had to give myself time to rest. And at this particular moment, I, I don't know when I'll be back home in the States again. So that's a little bit strange. Um, so, so, you know, you need to, you need to give yourself that time to just sort of, I don't know, explore worlds or just play a mindless first person shooter and just, you know. <laughs> yeah i get what you mean and like it's have you been in touch with like i'm assuming your family in the states is kind of like new jersey's kind of near new york which is near kind of the yeah. epicenter of all of this like has everything been okay on that front or my my family's safe and well and i'm very thankful for that my sister she works in an assisted living facility she has lost quite a bit of patience and that was sort of just uh, very, very brutal to hear about. And, you know, it's very tough when you can't, can't be there for someone, uh, you know, that's, that you love and care for and it's going through something really tough. So, you know, those, those places are pretty, pretty uh, uh, vulnerable, but, but they're all safe and well. And uh, lots of friends back home in New Jersey and also in Philadelphia are also hanging in there. Um, but, but yeah, the North of the state near New York really did get hammered. Um, and, and unfortunately, it seems like it's it's still kind of not not so much in New Jersey anymore, but the states is just getting a little more rough. Yeah. And tell me something, because you are, as far as I'm aware, you are the first third level student we've had on the show. We've had a few kind of secondary school students, mm. but like about your kind of college life, then did you have to keep studying and handing things in online, or was it just complete freeze, like for the two months or however long it was? Well, you know, uh, it's a good question. Yeah, we we two of my courses. Uh, were pre-recorded and sort of could be done at my own leisure and, and sort of that was nice in the sense that it sort of kept the schedule but also sort of kept kept uh, could, could pace it out you know a two-hour lecture into maybe one hour one day one hour another day one was through zoom and that was fine and good and good to see people who are now all over the place um, but yeah I had to keep handing things in now of course like every professor you talk to understood the gravity of the situation and um, 
you know, <laughs> I, I, I had a couple of friends who were like, should I ask for an extension? I said, if they don't give you an extension, I think they need the capital punishment because, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's, there's just no way that you, yeah. and anyway, on their front too, I mean, professors are sort of stressed and they had to cobble things together last minute and it's, it's been tough all around. Um, so, so yeah, I had to keep handing things in, but funny enough, uh, not to get too down the rabbit hole with philosophy, but what I study is um, uh, specifically like place, which sounds very abstract, but also like home and like how we feel at home, where we feel at home, uh, which has been really interesting to think about when those lucky of us to live in a home and have a house have been stuck in our house you know, <laughs> for hours on end. Uh, and, and you start to realize that like there's two functions, the home you know, like it's, it's, it's being in it and having a place to rest, but, but there's also the going out, you know, the going out and coming back, like the bed after a day of being out and about and running errands and doing class feels, it, it, it has its function, right? You come back to the bed, you fall, it, you collapse, you know, it, there's been so many nights where you, you, you just have been inside and you haven't done anything and you get to your bed at the end of the day and you're just like, I'm not tired, right? <laughs> And, and it's been pretty strange, I think, for a lot of people and, and, and sleep patterns and sort of stir craziness. And anyway, so that's that's apropos of nothing. No, but, but I know what you mean. It's like being yeah. stuck uh, in your home, especially if it's a home away from home for you. And if you're oh, a yeah. philosophy student, we'll give you a lot of time to mull on things, I'd imagine. Uh, yeah, especially when you live with someone else who's in the same program as you and you. Uh, which was some some of the sort of the fun thing if we get to talk about it. Me and my my housemate uh, got into playing Warzone. So one second we'd be sitting talking, be like talking about ethics and sort of society, mm-hmm. and the next minute we'd be blowing someone's heads off. So, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> there's there's it, there's a bit of a weird contrast there. I don't know. Well then, before we get into the Warzone stuff, uh, yeah. I feel like it's almost impossible to talk about gaming and the lockdown without mentioning Animal Crossing. Bizarrely, it has not got its own segment yet on the show, but that yeah. and Doom, I believe, were the first games to drop kind of during the real lockdown. They sold like hotcakes. Mm-hmm. Uh, currently, Rory Dunn holds the trophy of 250 hours when we recorded his episode. So what's been your Animal Crossing experience by contrast? Uh, 40 hours or more uh, nintendo has a weird way of weighing hours they always put like the actual hours and then say or more which makes it sound just like <laughs> was there more did i black out was <laughs> how much did I, of my time did i actually lose you know uh but but 40 hours is, is what i've spent so nothing nothing compared to 250 um but uh you know i really liked uh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Doom came out at the same time. I remember seeing someone animated Isabel into sort of the, the Doom style. Uh, there were so many great memes, but um, uh, people, people, I think, really picked up on Animal Crossing when it came out in this moment. And I think one of the things that really helped is, well, some people st- still found a way to do it, but Animal Crossing is like the anti-binge game. What do you mean by that? Well, like, especially this one, when you first start playing it, you know, they make you wait to the following day before something on the island opens, you know, for a lot of the different sort of like the museum and the shop, you sort of get the materials, you have to get all the materials together and then you give it to Tom Nook and he's like, check back tomorrow. And there's something nice about that because it's very easy in these days to find video games which you can just sort of binge and just sort of like run through. Uh, I mean, a lot of video games, hopefully these days, have like longer runtime than like 40 hours or so, you know? Mm. Um, But Animal Crossing seems to put time back in the video games. Like, I mean, a lot of other video games do this. It's nothing new, but like, I mean, there's there's, there's seasons, there are sort of different events that happen at different times of the day. And and I know you can time travel, and that's why I say some people will find a way to binge it, you know? (laughs) Like, like that is a long running animal crossing tradition. I, I understand it, I respect it. Um, but if you really look at it, it's, it's sort of a nice way of, of, of just slowing down. And um, if you just follow the natural time of the game, it's, 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 it's interesting, I think, I don't know. 
Okay, yeah, I see what you mean. Compared to The Sims, where you can like build endlessly and kind of get lost in these people's oh, yeah. lives and fast forward the days. So Animal Crossing kind of politely has these buffers, but it doesn't feel it's not like one of those paywalls where you just like slam into it. It's a kind of part of the yeah. experience, like. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not like Farmville. Oh my god, talk about a a relic. Uh, oh, where... blast from the past there. Yeah, where you where you put down seeds and then it's like come back in three days. It's like no, no. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's it's much more. I, I find it. Uh, the word wholesome is overused, but I definitely. Uh, no, I think from what I've seen, I think that's that'd be fair. It's like yeah, it's very strange to again contrasting to Doom, because even the nicest video games, like even on Nintendo, mm-hmm. do breed competitiveness and exhilaration, all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah. And Animal Crossing, apart from maybe the likes of like Harvest Moon or Stardew Valley, that kind of thing, mm. it is a very gentle experience, for lack of a better word. Except for when you get stung by wasps. <laughs> well, then, actually, let's let's get into the weeds of this. So, what is a yeah. normal day in Animal Crossing for you? Because I haven't played it in over a decade now. You know, I went into this one knowing that previous Animal Crossing games I played, I. I I, and I really only played, I think, which was the one for the DS. I think it was New Leaf. Um, and there was a point where you, I reached that, and I was like, sort of like, uh, I don't want to just keep picking weeds. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, you have to sort of... There was a point where I sort of lost the drive, but like with this, I was sort of... For me, I guess I, I, I load in. I always talk to my little villagers uh, because there are some good ones I have. I have a, a wonderful pink flamingo named Flora who is my my absolute favorite and is a delight and always talks about uh, sort of this bizarre mag love romance <laughs> or I don't know, you know, the dialogue in that game is something else. Um, I talk to them, just say hello. Sometimes they're very sassy. Uh, you know, check to make sure there's no weeds. Uh, sometimes if I see a good fish, go try and get that. Always get the always get the money rock. Um, the money the, rock. Oh yeah, 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 you know, if you hit the rock, you get the money from it. Oh yes, yes, of course. Yes, Sorry, I just, I just heard it and my brain just short circuited. Sorry, I just need a bit of clarification there. No, you're okay. I don't even know if there's a. Maybe people say bells rock because or rock. <laughs> ah, who knows? Um, but. Uh, I, I I know I, I've reached the point of the game now where you can customize your island and I want to do that and I want to do it well, but I also have to be writing a master's thesis right now. So I, <laughs> and it kills me because like I see all these wonderful just creations and I know they have an app now on online you can use to sort of like plan it out almost like full blown architecture. It's, it's nuts. Oh, uh, I thought you were going to talk about the. I'm, I'm, this is on the Nintendo Switch, yeah. It has a yeah, setting. Yeah, sorry. Because I've got a lot of nieces and nephews. Uh, there's a setting where you can program the Switch to turn off after an hour, like you know, kind of politely go into oh. sleep mode. So, I mean, if that helps, like you know, it does kind of help you cap your time. Like you can put the yeah. parent lock on. It's got like a little pin and all that kind of stuff. That 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 could be good. Animal Crossing, I, I I tend to be though pretty good when I when I feel like I've reached reached a point. I'm like, okay, I can put you aside. Uh, and then the, the other game that I was gonna maybe mention that is one I definitely lose time in, um, and I have a l- definitely a larger record of time lost than in Animal Crossing. Um, is this because uh, we talked a bit about the air? Of this is this Breath of the Wild now, or this is Breath of the Wild? Yeah. Yeah, so that's I, a popular one on this show. So what's your experience with Zelda? Was this your first Zelda game, or do you have a long history with it? I, so my first uh, game system was a PS2. And after that, the first Nintendo system I ever got was Game Boy Advance SP. Oh, uh, that's a forgotten classic. Oh, it is. And the day that, like, maybe five years ago, the back screen of it broke, I my heart broke. Uh because I miss I miss playing like classic Pokemon on there, mm. um, but I I never really played a lot of you know gradually when I started to get more Nintendo consoles I played a lot of Mario stuff I always liked playing Smash, um, I I I I didn't ever play Zelda though I 
eventually played in, in college. I played Ocarina of Time, and I was actually absolute, absolutely enraptured with it. Like we just sort of sort of were playing on a friend's console, and I never. I would always go and visit him and be like, I kind of want to play, you know? Yeah. Um, and then that sort of went away for a bit. And then I started playing Minish Cap on uh, Simulator. And then eventually, yeah, I got, a, I got a Switch and the Breath of the Wild had already come out, I think, like the previous year or whatever. Picked it up, started playing it, and I was absolutely in. Like, I, I, I did eventually finish Ocarina of Time on 3DS, and I was also like, great. Um, so yeah, it's, it's not my first, but I, I, it definitely made me more of a Zelda fan. And, and um, yeah. Okay, and can I ask, what is it that has drawn you to both Animal Crossing and, apart from the fact that both on the Switch, obviously, the Switch dictates it, but <laughs> why those games now? Do you like kind of exploring all these places and all that kind of stuff? Is there, or is it just kind of timing? Like, Yeah, I mean, well, so like I said, that's, that's definitely, the, like, yeah, there is something nice about the little, little island feeling of, of Animal Crossing. Timing was definitely more so for that because, like, when it came out, I was like, ah, I got to get it. And I, yeah. and I had had a little bit of money at that point. And I was like, it was around my birthday. I was like, I'll treat myself, you know. Um, but but Breath of the Wild, and it's probably been said ad nauseum at this point, like, for a, for a Nintendo game is, is pretty damn spectacular. And, like, there is such a real sense of exploration and horizon and scope and... You know, that, that first moment of when you come out of the sort of stasis chamber onto the Great Plateau and you just see this whole beautiful world and it's it's great. And also just walking it, you get a sense of like how big it is. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to ask about because yeah. there has been kind of a theme in the games people have been picking, at least among the video games, yeah. where people have loved big, wide adventure games, exploring games, even board mm -hmm. games where you can build long railroads and all that kind of stuff. And I'm wondering if there's like a causality and you're the person to ask me in a philosophy student <laughs> between like being stuck inside and playing games that allows you to explore an incredibly large world. Like, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think especially, you know, yeah, I, I think there's something, and that's, that's partially why I also started replaying it. Um, because I've been spending so much time sort of like unable, I, I'm a walker for myself. Like I, I'm, I'm very much a city person. I like to just, like a, like a good day for me is like wandering around the city or like going for a walk, um, maybe somewhere, you know, park or somewhere, I don't know. Um, and I think there's, there's something that's very unique about, and I, and I say this very aware if it's from a very able body perspective, so I'll qualify that, right? Um, but, but there's something very unique about when we walk because, you know, you, you, when you're really far away from something, and this is the case in Breath of the Wild, like you, you appreciate it. You can appreciate the size of a big mountain, but like once you get up to it and you start to see all the different textures and you get to start to interact with it in different ways, you know, something that seems so far away and different just becomes sort of a, like a macrocosm and, 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 the, and really, especially with Breath of the Wild, because like. You never know what you'll find, like the little Kokiri that pop up. For instance, the other day I was, I'm, I'm playing master mode right now. So that was the other reason I started to play. Um, because I had, I had already beaten the original, uh, the regular mode. And I was like, okay, let's see how much is this going to kick my butt. Um, so I don't have, have you played it? I have not. I must confess, okay. I find Zelda games very stressful, especially since I've gotten a baby. Like I'm like, all right, I want to go somewhere and get the thing done. And if if it's yeah. nice, like whereas whenever I played Ocarina of Time, I would just find myself getting lost and getting very <laughs> very stressed out. So I I know that there's an audience for that. Sirsha, who was on uh, episode four or five, she also hmm. talked about Breath of the Wild and just loved how. Literally, she could interact with everything. So yeah. I know there is an audience for that, you know? Oh, yeah. And it does get stressful sometimes because they have, like, this, this blood moon function that pops up and reinstates enemies. Mm. Um, and so it kind has, of a throwback like, to the Majora's Mask type thing, like... Well, you know, even funny enough, it's, it's, no one's ever, it's never been officially commented on, but, like, you can zoom in, like, on certain things. You can mm. zoom in on the moon. And there's like certain sort of spots on the moon. And I swear to God, it looks like the face in the Majora's Mask moon, um, which it gets red. And then it's like everything turns dark and there's this creepy music. And you get like, oh, my God. For the first couple of times I played it, I was like, what is going on? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, it's 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 something about just being able to just sort of throw yourself into an environment and just sort of. I mean, we we we're always somewhere, and and the places we're in say so much about ourselves. And and when when a really good world building environment does its job, it, it it tells a story in and of itself. And and there is a lot of that I think in Breath of the Wild. It's quite good. I would say like my only qualm with it. Uh, and it's a critique that some other people have brought up is there there Nintendo is trying to be a bit more progressive and they're they're getting there, but there is some very like transphobic themes in Breath of the Wild, which is a little disappointing. Okay. Yeah, there, there's a point where it's like, and I guess in, it's probably a video game trope at this point where Link has to get into an area that's basically a woman area only sort of this, this oh town. i see kind of like a cloud dressing up type situation like. yeah actually yeah and i and i had heard the discussion about the honeybee in uh, in one of the episodes and in this case you have to get a sort of uh g- women gerudo dress to sneak in and you get it from someone else who's who has it and is wearing it um who is by all means definitely like a trans character but everyone else always refers to her as sort of male pronouns and and at one point you do get it um but then the wind blows up and you presumably see the character's beard and link sort of looks shocked and it's like oh no um and there's a number of sort of trans video game critics that have talked about that and really really sort of exploded that point and i'm I'm glad that that's there because nintendo's getting better i think with sort of different diversity and i think like Pokemon's a good example. You're seeing a lot more diverse characters than that. And um, even now in Animal Crossing, I think you can have sort of diverse skin tones, um, which wasn't a thing in some of the previous games, I think. Uh, but there's still still a lot that needs to be sort of... Yeah, that's just it was just sort of like, that shouldn't be a joke. Um, but... But uh, to be in Nintendo's defense, like I think they are compared to the other video game industries, kind of led by personality. I think they are mostly pretty good at delivering games that are fun, but also incredibly wholesome. Like it's, oh, yeah. I really like the fact that I can bring almost any game over to my family down the road uh, on a Switch and kind of trade them back and forth. And I think they're very good for that sense of play, for lack of a better word. Like. Yeah, no, I mean, and then that's the really, that shows up in their consoles. I mean, what's the difference between a, I mean, like, what's the difference between a a PlayStation 1 and a PlayStation uh, 4? I mean, it's really just graphics capabilities and sort of, uh, obviously, a lot of different things. But, like, the difference between the GameCube and the Switch, like, Nintendo's consoles themselves are very playful. And and you see that with the Wii and what they did with the Wii U 2. They're always finding new ways of physically like changing you know Mm. um yeah there's a reason unfortunately enough that a lot of the nintendo games aren't compatible between each other and that's because they have unique features to them yeah yeah i definitely definitely nintendo's playfulness is sort of a real big attraction for me i just think that particular moment if you're going to include that yeah yeah uh, it it is a terrible shame and uh, i completely understand that people get upset about it uh but hopefully they will continue to kind of work harder and that kind of stuff it's always going to be the issue when you kind of take properties from other parts of the world and give them to an audience of such a huge range of views and all that kind of stuff but it's a fair point to bring up like and uh yeah i just hope it sort of hasn't spoiled breath of the wild for anyone because i know it's brought a lot of happiness to a lot of people like yeah i i mean it and and i know a lot of people still still play it anyway i just think uh and i and i still uh, it's one of my favorite games it really is um but it's just like it's like any movie or tv you know it's just part of being sort of uh conscious about those 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 things uh which which you're starting to see in a lot of i think indie games and a lot of indie gamers you know which i'm I'm only just now getting into a lot of indie gamers because i'm, I'm i finally have a computer that doesn't sort of burn out after you know, <laughs> anything over like well, it's got eight gigabytes of RAM, so it sort of reaches a ceiling at some point or another. But 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 there's there are, people are using interesting people are questioning in video games in really interesting ways, and so you know hopefully yeah, Nintendo sort of incorporates that too and, and sort of thinks about thinks about these things, you know. Excellent. Um, well, yeah. unfortunately, we are kind of hitting our 
kind of ceiling as far as time goes. Uh, but ah, is there yeah. anything you would like to say on the show before we wrap? Ah, uh, jeez. Uh, no, I just, um, yeah, I hope everything's okay with everyone. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about video games is that you can sort of, uh, oh gosh, I, I wish I had something really nice to wrap up on that. That's just, quite all right. I, in my experience, nice, it'll yeah. come to you the second we hang up. So, Absolutely, that's how it always is. So, thank you. <laughs> well, that sounds like an excuse to have you back on the show at some point. So, oh, fantastic. Paul, thank you so much for giving up the time for this. I hope you had fun on the show. Oh, yeah, this was delightful. Thank you so much. No worries at all. Uh, if you're listening at home, if you have enjoyed this episode, you can reach out to us on the Nerd to Know Media page or indeed our own Game of Corner Facebook page or Instagram. We Love to hear from new people. So if you've got something to say about any of the games you played or all that kind of stuff, hit us up on the comments or reach out to us. But for now, this has been The Game Corner. Uh, say goodbye to everyone, Paul. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. And we will see you next week. Bye. Yeah. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. 